uh, good afternoon, everybody. It will be a great pleasure to invite all of you, to welcome all of you here on our series, India and the World. That's Swasni Haider from the Hindu is speaking to us. Also grateful to the speaker, of course, and to admit Ambassador Vivek Karju, a dear friend for many years. Vivek was in the Foreign Service. He was ambassador in Thailand, Myanmar, and Afghanistan. I consider an expert on Pakistan because he handled it. He handled the Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iran desk in the 90s. And when we re-established an embassy in Kabul after the fall of the Taliban, in a burnt out, bombed out, burnt out house, Vivek camped there and set up the Indian embassy in Kabul, 2002. And I thought it was the right thing for me to request him. So once again, uh, before we start, could I request everybody to put their mobiles on silent modes, please? We prefer the flight mode, but silent mode will do. With this, let me hand over the mic to Vivek Karju. Uh, thank you, Shakti, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you, Shakti, for inviting me to this, uh, this talk by Suhasini. Um, the subject is important, uh, as is the speaker. Uh, she has a wealth of, of experience in uh, reporting on international affairs, on uh, writing and commenting on uh, international and global developments. And uh, she writes with, uh, with a perspective which is rooted in India's national interests. Uh, the subject itself is uh, uh, India and the world uh, from idealism to real politic. Uh, I, for one, as uh, someone who inhabited the world of diplomacy for, as a professional, have been always fascinated with these terms, idealism, real politic, etc. Um, uh, as a practitioner, uh, one, is, one was concerned with the pursuit of national interest and uh, the way that that interest was pursued, it didn't really matter whether it was rooted in idealism or real politic. Uh, perhaps all countries pursue real politic. Uh, certainly, I think our first Prime Minister, Nehru, pursued it. Uh, but uh, it is opportune on some occasions to cloak it within the garb of, of idealism. Uh, that's not only true for international affairs, it's also true for domestic politics. After all, which politician says that he's pursuing his own interest? Everyone says he's doing for the national good. And perhaps some of them do, uh, do much for the national good. Uh, so I hope uh, as uh, Sohasini explores this subject, uh, she will um, focus too on these terms and what they mean. Uh, I don't need to dwell on Sohasini's experience. She's with the Hindu, as, as Shakti said, but before that uh, she's had uh, an, a long innings as a journalist in different, uh, both in print and uh, in the audiovisual media. So uh, with those words, uh, Sohasini. Uh, how do we budget our time? You'll I think I'll speak for about half an hour, half if that an hour. works, and then I'll be open to Two questions, like and then we can like. see how it goes. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you, and, and thanks so much for joining us this afternoon. Um, you know, as someone who has now tried to cover foreign policy for a few decades, nothing um, lifts my heart as much as to see others who are similarly interested in the theory as well as the practice of foreign policy. Um, and all of you uh, who are sitting here below, I'm, I'm very grateful that you're listening even though you have to sit on the daris. And I'll try to keep my comments um, brief so that you, 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 you don't have to exert the whole afternoon um, on the floor. Um, the truth is, as Ambassador Kachu said, this is a debate that's not just happened today 
Um, you know, we, we use these terms as if we are defining the past as against the present. Uh, so this, this fight over principles versus pragmatism of morality um, versus uh, what is, you know, national interest, personal interest, and all the rest has been going on since forever. And, you know, the interesting thing is uh, as more and more of the archives become open uh, for, for us to read, you can look back even into the history of, say, the Indian National Congress and see where these... Uh, various debates have played out. There was a very interesting uh, debate they had uh, in the 1930s, for example, uh, which had its roots in, in, in the late 1800s, um, where they spoke about whether they should support the war effort, which was essentially a colonial one, uh, over, um, uh, over fascism. And, you know, what, what is the right decision to take, whether it's fascism, uh, or colonialism or imperialism. And at one point, the Congress actually took the, the path of saying, um, uh, of coming out with a, uh, a resolution that actually seemed to favor uh, Germany because it was so critical of uh, the British. Um, and then they quickly walked back from there. So I'm going to start at the beginning of the Republic. Um, modern India. I think was born at a moment that is so violent. And everyone can find different reasons for this particular moment uh, leading to the kind of uh, um, stated idealism of the times. Modern India was born in a moment so violent that it had to imagine a future that would be better. I refer, of course, to partition and to uh, the accompanying deaths of nearly two million but also to the Second World War, the Holocaust, the horror of which was really only completely revealed in the mid-1940s, genocides carried out in the name of war, in the name of world war across the world. Out of all this horror came the United Nations internationally, a moment of uh, excitement there. And here in India, there was the joy of independence. It was perhaps impossible to be untouched by the idealism of the times, or at least that need to feel that something now was bigger than all of us. As a result, India's foreign policy was, as it was articulated at the very beginning, one of idealism and really what the world should be, not as our founding fathers had found it. So in September 1946, Jawaharlal Nehru, who articulated um, Indian, India's foreign policy, was then the prime minister of the interim government with the following features. And let me just put them all up here for you so you can see them. This is uh, not exactly, he didn't say point to number one, point number two, and all the rest. This is summarized from his speech. And you can see some of the, um, of the points in there. Some of them may even surprise you. Uh, I speak, of course, to the, the younger ones amongst us. There are so many of you here that I'm, I'm very humbled because most of you will know what I'm about to say in terms of institutional memory alone. Um, full participation in international conferences, that was a time when, you know, these formulations were coming around, international conferences, alliances, forums, ideologies, and all the rest. Close contacts with the other nations and cooperation with them in the furtherance of world peace. This is a, a, a common theme in a lot of the points here. Non-alignment with power groups. Long before 1961, the first non-aligned movement, uh, long before 1955, we're seeing Pandit Nehru say right there that non-alignment with power groups is one of India's foreign policy objectives. Belief in the indivisibility of peace and freedom, this comes back to colonialism. Uh, the next one is also the same, special concern for emancipation of colonial and dependent countries. What is India saying over here? India is saying that we know we're getting our freedom but we're not going to forget those who are still bonded, those who are still in chains. And he's saying it again and again in, in, in these themes. Opposition to racialism, as it was known in those days, which is really racism, claim for equality and honorable treatment for the people of India anywhere in the world. This is the, you know, today we speak about pravasis. We, we've spoken about, you know, the rights of the NRI and all the rest of that. But there in 1946, Pandit Nehru was speaking um, about the treatment of people of India anywhere in the world. And finally, Vasudeva Kutumbakam. Need I say more? Belief in the ultimate evolution of one world based on closer cooperation and the absence of exploitation. These were all 
parts from his speech that I've put together for you to look at. Was this just one man's idealism? Certainly, Pandit Nehru was, as I think Stephen Cohen once described him, the chief foreign policy theoretician and almost sole practitioner of foreign policy for nearly 20 years. We don't get away from that. But India's foreign policy was as much about the aspirations of the nation, of where we saw our place in the world. What did we see ourselves as, as Indians? Uh, and, and this is something that I have sensed from so many of, uh, of the foreign policy practitioners of the time that I've been privileged to know, that there was a sense that foreign policy was so much more than just uh, you know, us or our interests. We certainly didn't follow the philosophy of Thucydides, uh, um, who narrated in that passage in the history of the Peloponnesian War. And now I'm going back to 431 BCE. So what was it that, where does this term real politic come from? And uh, Ambassador Kaju had said we should discuss. Now Thucydides is seen perhaps as the foremost exponent or the first exponent of this concept of real politic. It was built over the years and I'll tell you where the term actually came from. But whether you speak about Chanakya, whether you speak about Machiavelli, whether you speak about other practitioners who also spoke about diplomacy of a nation uh, and promoting its interests, Thucydides seems to have been, at least, uh, among the first. Here's what he said. <clears throat> right as the world goes is only in question between equals in power. While the strong do what they can and the weak suffer what they must. Uh, this is now a very popular phrase used in a lot of uh, writing. Um, and we certainly didn't subscribe to it. Uh, we didn't just subs not subscribe to the words. We actually rejected the context because, <clears throat> just to give you a little bit of background on this, uh, on why Thucydides wrote it, this is part of what is called the Melian Dialogue. Uh, when in uh, Athens they decided at one point in their war with Sparta, there was a bit of a break, and they decided to take over this island of Milos. And the people of Milos then came out and said, but this is wrong, this is not moralistic, uh, we are a neutral country, why are you taking us over? Of course, Athens conquered them anyway, and Sparta um, freed them many years later. But that was the context of this, of why he said it. And we as Indians actually pride ourselves not just on having this uh, foreign policy of morality, if you like, but that only Indian culture, only Indian religion, only Indian language, Hinduism, Buddhism, these are the things that have left Indian shores and conquered other lands. This is certainly an age of idealism. These are, these are what we believe. Um, we will come to the realistic part of it a little later. So I say, as I said, in this age of idealism, what did we see? It was not just that we were looking to idealism, but on the other side of it, if you flipped it over, it was marked by what I dare say was an absence of realism. If we have to look back at history, we have to look back at history, not just in praise of it. And I think this absence of realism is something that we see a lot in our discourse today, that there was such an absence of realism at the time, we suffer today because of it. Whether or not that is true, it is important to look at how scholars have put together that absence of realism. And these are just some of the points that have been identified over the years. One, that the period left us militarily not thinking strategically. We, we thought in terms of the world being a happy place, of the world liking us, and perhaps ignoring threats, ignoring what are called balance of power calculations. Should we have been more alert on China? That's a question that haunts us to this date. I mean, there is a reason why, despite the fact that really we've had no real conflict with China since 1962, we still live with its uh, trauma. Should we have built defenses accordingly? Should we have seen the nuclear testing coming? Should we have planned for it otherwise? Should this famous idea that we gave up our seat at the UN Security Council because China didn't have one uh, denote naivety? of the time? Did it denote an idealism that India has had to pay for? The second is what I had earlier referred to, this morality question keeps coming back. Stressing the importance in international law, international politics, and completely discounting what Thucydides said, 
this idea that force is actually the driving force of politics. Your ability to effect the solutions are really your, um, are really what count. And so whether it was an African colonialism, whether it was an international interventions, we took strong stands. Was that correct? This is the morality question. The exaggeration of India's importance in global politics. Some would say we're still, we're still actually guilty of doing this. But there's a very famous story that I remember <coughs> reading about. And I actually found the newspaper clipping of the time. <coughs> Um, when in 1951, the U.S. was planning the San Francisco uh, Peace uh, Summit, where they were essentially talking about how to give reparations to Japan um, for all that they had done over there, Truman invited Nehru. Now, just two months before this, um, America had actually sent a whole bunch of par uh, parcels of food aid to India. So they felt that, you know, India should be deeply grateful and should be, you know, quite... Uh, pleased to come and be a part of the American Alliance at this conference. And in fact, Nehru wrote back, saying, I refuse to come. And he refused to come on the grounds, quote, that it failed to meet the expectations of the Japanese people. Here, Nehru was standing up to the Americans on behalf of the Japanese people. There's a lovely footnote to that, where Truman is supposed to have written on a note to uh, his Secretary of State, who does he think he is? But that's that's, I mean, that shows actually uh, the meaning of the term, and I don't mean it in any offensive uh, way to say the exaggeration of India's importance in global politics. This is what we felt we were. We could tell the Americans, you know, treat the Japanese better. It's a different matter that in time Japan and U.S. had, a, had the strongest alliance, and uh, certainly we got very few kudos for the next few decades for this great piece of um, standing up. There's the misidentification of the sources of India. So we're talking about things that <coughs> kept us away from realism, right? So another one that's been identified is the misidentification of the forces, of the sources of India's power and influence. While perhaps the world always looks at India, and I see this a lot when I'm traveling, the world looks at India in marvel, not because of our force, not because of our influence. They marvel at India because of our diversity. They marvel at India because of its tolerance, of its ability to have cared or spoken up for the voice of, of those who were voiceless, I mean internationally, in all those years, and marveled at our democracy. Uh, instead, sometimes we tend to overblow the idea that actually India has got this huge international interest because of the power we wield or the, the numbers that we are uh, or the influence we perhaps have in our region. Um, so this is, this is one of the theories. Um, and finally, overemphasizing the role of morality in international politics when, as we know, morality is at best a bahana, uh, a reason to take a predetermined cause of action. The funny part, and many of you may not know this, is that when we look back at Pandit Nehru, and it is fashionable, I'm sorry to say, at this time to look at Pandit Nehru as somebody who just, you know, he, he looked through rose-tinted glasses. He didn't see what was coming. Um, and, uh, and as a result, India's foreign policy did not have the ballast it should have had. We, shouldn't have, we should have been tough. We should have been stronger. It was actually Pandit Nehru who cast the first stone at himself. In 1962, in a public speech, he said, and I quote this from the Hindu. I was very pleased to find the piece in my uh, newspaper. We were getting out of touch with reality in the modern world, and we were living in an artificial world of our own creation. We have now been shocked out of it. Uh, he said this on uh, 26th October 1962, so we know what he was referring to. Um, but more than anything else, we must remember that, that that generation of thought process contained within it that ability to think, rethink, and cast a, a, a shine a light on itself. Um, this, this was um, what Pandit Nehru said. And this is not to say, and I agree with Ambassador Kaju, that this is not to say Indian foreign policy was really greatly idealistic in practice. Um, we know, of course, uh, that Pandit Nehru himself wrote to the US just before the war with China, uh, asking for help. That certainly did not fit in with anything else uh, that would have been part of our foreign policy. Uh, the Soviet alliance that Indira Gandhi forged, and I'm now running through a few decades, as you can see, or turning a blind eye to the Soviet action in Afghanistan. Um, 
Rajiv Gandhi then and the intervention in Sri Lanka. The reason I'm putting all of these together is simply because, um, with the exception uh, of a few years in between, what we saw was a progression from the Nehru dynasty that in which nobody would have really questioned uh, the policies of the time or the idealism of the time, even if they had um, questioned it in reality. What it actually means when we say that this was an age of idealism is that theoretically India felt its foreign policy represented ideals, whether it was at the UN or Bandung and the NAM or the decision to give the Dalai Lama refuge. India always punched above its weight because of this morality. Paradoxically, Indian foreign policy was seen as very weighty for a nation that constituted just 4% of the global GDP in 1947, today we're close to, I think, double that, whose population lived an average of only 32 years at the time. 32 was the average lifespan of an Indian. 18.3% were literate, and 50% of our country lived on 180 rupees a year. We were proud Indians despite all that, and our foreign policy reflected how we saw ourselves, independent, courageous, and engaged with the world. So clearly this was an age of idealism, which now I'm going to walk you away from. So we didn't transition to where we are today just you know, overnight. This has always been a progression. It's always been a practice. I'm skipping through, as I said, a few decades, simply because I'm trying to pick out the little highlights that perhaps characterize this, er uh, this part, but you're most welcome to ask me questions about the rest later. <clears throat> the 1980s had not been good to the country, nor to its foreign policy outlook. With the collapse of the USSR, India lost its principal international backer. The US-Pakistan clinch that drove the Soviets out of Afghanistan also effectively cut India out of the power equations there. Relations with China remained frozen. And India fought two big insurgencies that further complicated international relationships, not just our relationship with Pakistan, for example, but also strained ties with the UK and Canada. In Sri Lanka, our ties were strained, of course, over all that happened with the LTT. So why then is 1991 seen as such a turning point? See, Rajamohan, who's clearly, you know, one of our strategic thinkers and one of, I mean, I'm very privileged to call him a, uh, an illustrious colleague um, in the profession as well, put it because of five reasons. He said India turned. It was like watching a massive ship which suddenly <coughs> took a very big turn. Normally, India is likened to this ship that takes its own time in turning around, but the early 90s did it to us very quickly. What were the changes that happened? from a socialist to a capitalist economic outlook, part of it because of the fact of our economy at the time, um, from a foreign policy driven by politics to one driven by business. This is a recurring theme in uh, Prime Minister Narsimha Rao's speeches and his, in his writing as well. From being a third world champion, this is certainly something we started to give up, to saying we have a spot on the high table that we are no longer just talking about being part of a solidarity of NAM, who I think at that time was still about 60 or 70 countries, today it's about 120. But now we want to talk about being on that stage on our own. From anti-West to pro-US, and I can tell you the difference from my generation uh, till now, because when I joined uh, the profession, one of the first deals I was uh, privy to was, I, I was working at CNN in those days, and this was this very hardcore American company, and they tied up with Doordarshan. And um, within about six months of that deal, it went, you know, Parliament was in uproar, they refused to allow this deal to go forward, uh, simply because of the inherent anti-Americanism uh, that existed at the time. Today, we, you know, we look at CNN very differently. In fact, CNN is a part of a very uh, popular a channel over here. In fact, some would say it's because of the CNN branding that the channel has been able to do well. I worked for them as well. Um, so those were the five points that uh, Raja had put out. What did it mean for the shifts in our, this attitude on idealism and realism? To begin with, India's defense dependence. You know, we suddenly realized how dependent we were on the USSR. So India's defense dependence 
pivoted away from Russia. Oh God, this is very small, I'm sorry, because I've brought out lots of uh, points, but I'll read them out to you. Um, so this was the first move which actually becomes more and more important as the years go by. The second is really the decline of support to Arab nationalism as it were. This was a product of our idealistic past. The rise of Israel's significance in both defense and trade and certainly it was in the early 90s that we decided to uh, establish full diplomatic relations um, with Israel. But you know, there were two things happening. One was the Gulf War. One was our own movement uh, in West Asia. Um, it sort of coalesced because Arab nationalism saw it take a hit, of course, in Iraq, but then you know, Libya, Syria, all of these countries have, have actually um, now seen that whole concept go away. Uh, Nasser was no longer around <coughs> to, to string them together. Within just a few years of being recognized, India became, uh, Israel became India's second largest arms suppliers worldwide and one of its biggest trading partners uh, in West Asia. There are those who would argue that this too is a shift away from idealism to realism. There was another consequence that hit closer home, and that was of economic liberalization. Suddenly, our foreign policy was incorporating bits of the economic liberalization because now I would go abroad and, you know, I can remember even when joint statements and uh, foreign policy visits would shove the trade to the side, uh, that trade and business was really not a part of it. Now, in fact, they first announce all the business partnerships. They say this trip is likely to see MOUs worth so much being signed. Uh, investment from a country becomes uh, more and more the symbol of, of good ties between two countries. Um, regardless of the reality that actually there are several examples of countries who have very good business ties but actually uh, <coughs> not, 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 not very good political ties. But we're beginning to see that shift in the way of thinking. Um, and certainly things that were seen as Nehruvian notions, self-reliance, um, public enterprise, publicly owned enterprise, were seen really as a thing of the past. The third, and this is something that I don't see too much written about. You know, apart from the big leaders of our countries, and by that I mean people who have the, the mandate uh, for themselves. These are not coalition government leaders. These leaders tended to build their own foreign policy completely on their own. Um, I, that's why they're seen as such large presences, whether it was Pandit Nehru, but also Indira Gandhi, also Rajiv Gandhi. And now today we see it with Prime Minister Modi, where they have this mandate from the people and therefore the foreign policy becomes a little less structured. It becomes more of what the leadership of the time wants to drive it as. In contrast, um, and I'd love for a study on this <clears throat> at some point, um, in contrast, coalition governments or people who have not felt as strong have looked for structure. Um, the first example actually of that is Lal Bahadur Shastri, who initiated the first overhaul of the, foreign, uh, of the IFS during his short tenure. And we saw the term of the Secretary General go away and, and uh, have the more egalitarian sort of foreign secretary, first amongst equals, um, come in. So it's not just these five, but I'm looking at these five prime ministers <clears throat> between 1990 and 2014 who headed coalitions. Each of them, including Mr. Devagaura, who had the briefest of them all, I think, um, pushed for a more structured approach with Pakistan. And the composite bilateral dialogue came about. We saw a more structured position with, uh, with China that began with uh, Mr. Narsema Rao and uh, the peace and tranquility agreement that then gave way to the three, uh, 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 three-step border negotiations as well. Those are the only structures we've seen in these very troubled relationships. We have not seen those structures come from perhaps the tougher, stronger leaders who had a very clear idea where they wanted to go and perhaps thought they could run the relationship uh, and we saw that a little bit with Rajiv Gandhi, um, uh, uh, with Pakistan and China as well, but we've seen them with all the others. The next shift was of pursuing independent economic relations in our neighborhood, which till then had suffered. There was no question about it. But suddenly free trade agreements with Sri Lanka, Bhutan, Nepal were signed. Uh, SAFTA became something people spoke about. Um, and then there was the need for energy diplomacy 
this became a new term actually in the early 90s, post Gulf War, we realized that we were going to have to deal with suppliers of energy very differently from the past. It was no longer about our political problems with them or their support to Pakistan or um, how our uh, diaspora was being treated, but sim simply about energy diplomacy, if you like. And then, um, uh, and then came 9-11, and global terror became the next pointer. So what we were doing was moving away from what could be seen as strained principles of foreign policy to seeing what is it that we need to do in order to fit in with this current political scenario. Uh, and global terror certainly became one of those anti-terror pacts. Uh, just like I said, the change was uh, we saw with, with the, the economic and trade relations, we saw it with these anti-terror pacts coming up um, as well. And some have argued that the Indo-US nuclear deal was certainly an outcome of that. Even the idea of deciding to just set aside our problems with China and go ahead towards the goal of $100 billion in bilateral trade could be seen as an outcome of those times. Um, and finally, the past two decades saw uh, a decided shift in Indian foreign policy towards the diaspora. Pravasi Bharatiyas, as they are called, became a critical part of building ties with countries. And as India's economy grew, so did the Pravasi desire to be involved um, with Indian policy. This is not, India is not the only country to do this, but certainly we saw it. So we go through this long list, and I'm trying to walk you through that um, uh, the, the transition that is already coming <coughs> in our thoughts. You'd asked where the term came from, realpolitik. Uh, it's a term that dates back to 1853, and the German philosopher von Rakow, who um, essentially said the law of power governs the world of states just as the law of gravity governs the physical world. That's, that's a very, very strong statement. What you're essentially saying is, as you know that the law of gravity is one of the most powerful forces on Earth, you know that it is the law of power that will govern the international ties, that will govern the world of states. Uh, and he said this in 1853. I won't go through the rest. Uh, it's actually part of the title of his book. It's a very long title in German um, that includes this line in it as well. So we saw this now move to real politic come up. And whether it was perhaps the growing ties with the US allowed us to turn a blind eye to say what was happening in Afghanistan, uh, turn a blind eye really to its double standards when it came to Pakistan, um, and generally turn a blind eye to what was happening in the rest of the world. Whether it was our own muscle power in the neighborhood. Remember that we talk about muscle power in the neighborhood today, but there in 2009, and I think when you're talking about real politic, uh, everyone will place it at a different, some will say it's coming into sharp, clear focus only since 2014. Um, I would say somewhere in the UPA second term is where we begin to see India asserting itself in a new way that could possibly describe real politic. Um, when Prime Minister Manmohan Singh, for example, and these are very, very little examples because we're looking, I mean, you know, it's difficult to really analyze recent history, and I think 2009 is certainly very recent. Um, when Prime Minister Manmohan Singh, for example, decided not to travel to Sri Lanka for the Commonwealth, this was not about principles. This was about, A, domestic political compulsions with Tamil Nadu, and it was about the idea that we had asked the Sri Lankan government to do X, Y, and Z, and they had not done it. So we decided we will not attended. It was, a, it was a decision that had, uh, according to me, was a seminal moment because we saw uh, a lot of our foreign policy uh, assumptions change. Our votes on Syria, for example, at the United Nations that turned from no, which was our normal default, to abstentions, and then finally to yes. And I think uh, Ambassador Hardeep Puri spoke over here, but he, he really saw that whole process uh, through, and, uh, and I would commend you to read his book because he actually questions whether that was uh, the right decision at the time. Or even Prime Minister Manmohan Singh's decision not to visit Pakistan until a peace agreement was ready. Now many of us, including many of us in this room, have seen that as a missed opportunity, that in 10 years he couldn't find the time to go to Pakistan or the opportunity. But the opportunity again was missed not because of, of a principle, it was missed because of pragmatic realism, that the visit would come at too great a domestic cost if he didn't have something uh, to show for it. 
We'll move quickly then to where we are today. And as I said, um, you know, my, my sincere belief is that you cannot, you cannot really study foreign policy history as recent as three years ago. So a lot of this is just ideas in the mind, and, and you're most welcome uh, to weigh in on whether you think these, in fact, mean uh, the shift that I'm proposing over here. Um, the first one that is, is plain and simple to see uh, is that the US today is a major defense partner. Whether we know what that means or not, because this was a term created exclusively for India, it is something short of being an ally. And actually, that's what it is. Um, Inherent in that, in fact, you will find it funny that I have put them both into the same line, uh, is that NAM is discarded. Non-alignment, um, we can skin this cat in any way we'd like, uh, but the fact is we have not only discarded it in, uh, in, th in practice, which many of us think we did some time ago, but in theory as well. After Prime Minister Modi decided not to travel to Venezuela last year, uh, and became only the second prime minister to do so, the other one uh, being during the transition of the Janta government in the 70s. It was very clear, the message that was given, that for the moment, uh, NAM does not work for India. The second is the openness with which we now refer to China as an adversary. The process that began in 1993 was a little soft, you know, it was trying to couch what was essentially a difficult relationship, we knew it was a difficult relationship, but we were trying to couch it by saying, uh, let's start a process. Let's do something that can put our problems on one side and not really look at the big problem, which is that we think of China as the elephant in the room or the dragon in the room. Um, and it, it's possible hegemonistic tendencies to be a problem for us, not just for the, uh, for the South China Sea or for any other region, but we now see it as an adversary. Um, we have taken steps in the last few years that make it very clear that we are willing to join a kind of um, formation that would take China on as well. Uh, I think the, the agreement we signed with the U.S., again, is a seminal moment in Indian foreign policy, uh, the one that looked at the Indo-Pacific and looked uh, very specifically at uh, our maritime concerns and the need for maritime patrolling um, over there. The fact is that whether it was peaceful platitudes with China or whether we were actually trying to build a process that would allow us to grow as Asian giants and not be competitive and not be confrontational, um, whether or not that was actually some kind of uh, woolly-eyed uh, idealism, it certainly doesn't exist anymore. We have moved to the real politic when it comes to China. We also see soft power as hard power. Indians. India's soft power is today our hard power. We use it. We don't just talk about, uh, I mean, I'm not talking about Bollywood and universities, but we make a point of projecting India's power as a sum of things like Bollywood, or as a sum of things like the university educations we give other countries. Uh, and of course, is the use of our diaspora. There's almost a cynical sort of um, idea that when Indian, people of Indian origin go to higher positions of power in countries around the world, that somehow that means something good for us. Uh, I think that's, that's fairly uh, evident. And as I said, India is not the only country to do it. The US does it. Israel does it. Uh, China certainly does it as well. The next is this idea that we have of the willingness to fle flex muscle. And this is flex muscles beyond what we were talking about, say, in 2009. This is a willingness to squeeze our neighbors and to tell them when we are unhappy with them that it is going to hurt them. I'm not sure this works. Uh, I think, you know, we've still got to watch all of these things for many years, but we've seen what's happened in the last couple of years, and we can extrapolate a little bit from it. So, for example, the Nepal blockade, um, which uh, we call the Nepal blockage because we're not quite sure how that came about. Um, but we do know that it coincided with our deep unhappiness over the way they had pushed through their constitution. And while there was a principle over there when it comes to Madhesi's rights, there was a principle there when it came to a more equitable constitution. The fact is that India is now seen as a country that is willing to squeeze, not just flex. Um, the Sri Lankan government change seems to fit into that pattern in our region. Uh, again, you know, it, it's not necessarily what we do, but what we are perceived as doing uh, in the region 
Uh, and then finally, our decision to isolate Pakistan. Again, uh, I'm not sure this is working out in practice, which we will know in the uh, coming years. But the fact that we were able to say it, the fact that we said we will isolate Pakistan, we will look at SARC minus one, uh, we will make every other country in the neighborhood stand up and castigate Pakistan um, for its uh, role in terrorism. This is, is a real politic sign. You know, we are saying now that we know power matters and only power matters. Um, we've seen it in the hunt for resources, both in West Asia and Africa, actually, our foreign policy is doing a lot of very, very important maneuvers. Uh, and these are essentially aimed at those very uh, precious resources. Maybe China is a little ahead of us in that game. Maybe the UK is a little ahead of us in the game. But we're certainly in that game now, uh, which is very important. And we are unashamed about our desire for the high table. There may be a, been earlier, you know, we would like this. Now it is, okay, nice to meet you. Can you please endorse our candidature for the UN Security Council? Can you please let us know where you stand on the NSG and are you willing uh, to support us or not? We saw this just yesterday with a country like Turkey, where many would say, you know, where, where are the principles or what was expected to come out of this visit? Um, certainly in terms of the bilateral, what was coming out of this visit was a show of power. We were showing that one of uh, the most powerful countries in West Asia was standing there shoulder to shoulder with us. They may not have completely, you know, they've, they've couched a bit of their language on their support for us on the Security Council and on the NSG. Um, but, but that's where that change is leading us. So we've looked at this transition that has come through um, all these decades, and I can see I have nearly out finished my, my time. Um, and the question is, where to next? We've come through this age of idealism, the age of realism, the age of real politique. Where is this going to lead us? And there are many thoughts that go through my mind. But I'd like to actually do uh, what is seen as a cop-out, really, and put questions to the audience here. Because these are questions you can look at, can go home to, <clears throat> and think about. Because they will lead us to where India is headed when it comes to its foreign policy. The first question being, should India, the other question can be, can India make the leap to the high table of the world without bringing up its economic bottom line? There are other countries that have done it differently. There are other countries that have said, we'll stay quiet um, until we can show a certain economic prowess and then move up. And I'm not talking about the amount of FDI in India. I'm talking about the basic bottom line of the average person in India <clears throat> of the per capita income. Um, the, the, the second question is, can India be a world power? And all of these are can and should questions. Can India be a world power without taking its neighbors on board? Um, there are many ways to look at this as a, you know, one is a metaphysical plane, but the other is very nuts and bolts. I mean, in 2006, for example, we, uh, we put up a candidate for the UN Secretary General, um, uh, Mr. Tharoor. Uh, at the time, what hurt us was not that we lost, because we actually came a, a good second. What hurt us was that <clears throat> nobody in our neighborhood voted for us, and it was worse because we actually put up a candidate against our neighborhood. One of them was from Afghanistan, someone very famous, uh, uh, Mr. Ashraf Ghani. One was a Sri Lankan UN diplomat, Jayanta Dhanapala. Um, both of them, when they bowed out, actually didn't bow out in India's favor. Um, and um, all of them you know, endorsed uh, Ban Ki-moon. So we're looking at that question again. Is it can, is it should we go to this place without being able to take all our neighbors on board? Is someone else going to take our neighbors on board with them? Is the world now too intertwined for bilateral alliances or enmities to define our relationships? There are no more zero-sum games, some believe, that we no longer say my enemy's enemy is my friend because everybody is dealing with everybody. There are no real alliances anymore because I will decide on my alliance. I might go with China for trade. I might go with the US for politics. I, I'm not necessarily wanting to be put, put pinned down like that. And if connectivity is the new currency, should India pursue connectivity at all costs? Because after all, we have drawn a line in the sand as far as the Belt and Road Initiative goes until our political concerns are looked at. 
we're not interested to be a part of this very, very connected world. Are we going to lose out by that? That's certainly a question we have to ask. Finally, and this is a question I get asked most by people outside the country, because when they come, they see how, no, it's not, and it's not just a government thing, it's an Indian thing. We ask, you know, how long are you going to keep us out of the UN Security Council? How long are you going to deny India its rightful place in the sun um, on the world stage? Uh, and that question is, what will India do if it makes it to this world leadership position it so desires? Are we going to be driven by our own power and how we can wield it when it comes uh, to bilateral relationships? Our friends, our enemies, will that be important to us? Um, will it be uh, uh, about becoming more, you know, world bodies becoming more uh, invasive worldwide? Where does India want to lead with this? Because certainly sitting on the fence, as India is accused of doing, is not going to be an option uh, when we are in that leadership position. And at the same time, there are those who feel that what we are moving to is not real politic as much as it is an assertion of India's nationalism. And to those I would like to ask, are we then in danger of walking a full circle from where our country began? Because nationalists, and certainly hyper-nationalists, and the national objective of the time, as we now hear a lot more about, are no more the realists than the original idealists that founded our republic were. I'll leave it over there, and I'll take all your questions. Thanks. <laughs>